here I am in Linköping, Sweden. This is Sweden's seventh largest city. It's a fairly sleepy university town. It's actually rather beautiful. The weather's gorgeous. And this is the old cathedral that's been here on site since uh, 1100, although most of it built in the two to three hundred years after that. It's also home of the Swedish Society of Gastroenterology this week. And I was really honoured to be invited by Matthias Soup to open the whole meeting and give the Bent Ear Prize lecture, which I delivered on the impact of diet, environment and the microbiota on inflammatory bowel disease. Talking about why we're getting inflammatory bowel disease more commonly around the world today, why the prevalence is going up, what the impact is on patients' lives, illustrated with cases from my clinic, and thinking about how the environment has a role in the onset of disease, but also can have a role in managing disease as well. So I talked quite a lot about ultra-processed foods and what we're learning about emulsifiers from that original discovery in mice from Bernard Chassing about 10 years ago, and the ADAPT study that Kevin Whelan has been running in London with Benoit and James Lindsay. Well, I think they've completed recruitment to that now. This wonderful study where patients with Crohn's disease go on an emulsifier free diet, and then there's a resupplementation of foods that are blinded to either contain or not contain emulsifiers. It's going to be very, very interesting to de indeed to see if that finding translates through. But in terms of translating findings through, I spent most of the time talking about what we've been learning from our PREDICT study. Two big papers from PREDICT, one looking at the flares over time and the impact of calprotectin and diet, and the other looking at psychosocial factors, including anxiety, depression, stress, and sleep and exercise, that are almost ready for submission. But presenting quite a lot of the data today, showing how in the 2,500 patients that we recruited well, i.e. in self-reported clinical remission, that the impact of the residual inflammation, these calprotectin levels that 18% still had greater than 250 and maybe 30% had between 50 and 250. And we've, we've shown very clearly that actually these three groups separate amazingly over time. So those patients with very, very low calprotectins, less than 50, seem to behave, I think, differently biologically. They have almost no very low flare rates. Those greater than 250 are, as you would expect, flaring the most, but clear separation for that middle group, suggesting that targeting a calpro of less than 250 to maybe even greater than 50 um, is going to be helpful for our patients in the longer term. Looking at diet, and we found this association with meat intake and risk of hard flare, that is increase in symptoms, increase in inflammation, and necessitating a change in treatment in patients with ulcerative colitis, but Crohn's disease. And that's in keeping with the literature about the role of meat intake and the risk of IBD onset or ulcerative colitis onset. So we're looking at these data in more detail still now with a final analysis before we submit this paper. But interestingly, we've very recently just finished an analysis uh, that Karia Kontroni has been doing with Nathan Constantine Cook in my group, looking at the role of stress, looking particularly at depression and anxiety. We find anxiety in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis to be associated with soft flares, patient-reported flares in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. But with depression, we see an association with hard flare specifically. You don't see that with anxiety, but in depression and ulcerative colitis patients, irrespective actually of what patients have reported in previous years, so there seems to be this unidirectional effect increasing to the evidence that we're gathering that there is actually a pro-inflammatory effect of depression um, that could be triggering these flares of ulcerative colitis. Similarly, actually, low levels of exercise. So if you exercise less than the minimum recommended amount per week, which is 75 minutes of vigorous exercise or 140, 150 minutes of moderate exercise, like walking, if you're less than that, you're at risk of hard flare and ulcerative colitis too. This is very interesting. Ulcerative colitis in particular, then we're seeing risks of meat intake, of depression, and of low physical activity with um, hard flare in ulcerative colitis. So more to come for all of that. Perhaps finishing on a sort of philosophical note, I was thinking more about how we're actually going to implement these behavioral changes in people that have inflammatory bowel disease in the clinic when we're sure that there are the right things to do. And many of these things, of course, 
eating less meat, increasing fiber intake, decreasing sugar intake and ultra processed food intake, eat a Mediterranean style diet, sleep well, exercise more, manage stress, screen for anxiety and depression and treat because that might improve things over time. Some of these things we can do, some of these things we can only recommend and I think whilst we do those things we have to be sensitive to patients, their circumstances, their educational levels, their access to support, the access that we're able to provide to support and even with all of those things the ability to make behavioural change. We've seen that multiple times before and actually you know if you look at smoking, if you look at um, diet where things haven't worked and or smoking and alcohol where things have like the public smoking ban like the minimal alcohol per unit pricing rule that's just come into play in Scotland in the last couple of years where things are making a difference and I think for some of these diet things we are going to have to start doing that as well. So in the meantime I think we need to keep curious, we need to keep providing more and more hard data, we need to be empathetic to our patients and actually perhaps most importantly we need to remember that when we're in the clinic with our patients, we do need to ask about these things even if we don't have answers. All of the evidence, everything we've learned, tells us that for a person that has inflammatory bowel disease who is tired or who is flat or who is having poor sleep or is actually very depressed or whatever it is, it's a good opportunity if they can acknowledge it and have it um, responded to in an empathetic way. So I will ask people, you know, quite simply often, you know, how is your sleep? How are your energy levels? How is your mood? Are you able to concentrate? Are you able to do all the things that you would like to do? Any issues with intimacy? Any concerns with family planning? Is there any foods that you're unable to eat? You know, what is the quality of your diet like? Should we have a look at that in more detail or, or leave that for another time? So often there are things that we can do, controlling the inflammation, screening for depression, referring and treating, but sometimes it's just having that empathetic ear and being, you know, a good caring doctor, that's what really matters. Before I go, I do just want to show you something. So here you are, the burnt uh, medal that I've just been awarded. Really, really chuffed to get this from the Swedish Society of Medicine engraved with my name on the side which you probably can't see just there so thanks for listening today as always i am going back to edinburgh in a hot minute to be back for the clinic tomorrow thursdays of course ibd clinic day in edinburgh and to check in with the team before we fly on friday morning out to dc for ddw digestive diseases week so expect more updates from me then until now from beautiful sunny Swedish Linköping with the ancient cathedral. Goodbye.